Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. And this was legal in the back. Now, wait, 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 wait,
Every day he asks me, how do you feel? Do you belong? I want to say, I belong. <laughs> do you belong? I know you belong. <laughs> I've been with you through these past days. And again, Dr. Hodge said he was really excited about this topic. And when they sent me the email, I said, I'm so scared about this topic. <laughs> it scares me. It's, it's a huge topic that is currently in our nightmares, in our dreams, in our everyday life, particularly those like me who do public health programs, implement the programs for the people. And in, in my organization, Project Concern International, we are in 15 countries. So I lead the United States uh, field programs for my organization. And every day you see the impact of health programs among people. And so I want to share with you my own personal mission statement because I, we've heard the word humbled, honored, and I'm all of the above in your presence uh, with you these past few days. And moving forward with you, with Voices for Fathers and the Tuskegee uh, Museum and all of the above that you're so wonderfully doing. I want to share with you my personal mission statement, and that is, when I transitioned to public health from clinical practice, I said, what am I doing with my life? And so my personal mission statement is, I, Maria Lourdes Reyes, you don't want to know my other names. <laughs> I have five names, Maria Lourdes Antonia Fernandez Reyes. <laughs> and I am a Benedictine oblate, so I'm a lay monk, moving on to the nunnery, to the convent, hopefully, as, as is willed. My monk name is Sister Teresa, not yet Sister, you see? It's going to happen. I promise you, it's going to happen. My students don't believe it, but I said I already saw myself in a habit with blue, so there. So, my oblate name is Therese Bernadette. Because I'm Lourdes, the, 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 uh, you know, the apparition in Lourdes. And so I took Bernadette, because I claim Bernadette. So my personal mission statement, five minutes later, is <laughs> I am dedicated to the realization of human potential through servant leadership. And so as CEO of my company, as director for the United States program for my organization, I should be up there, but I don't. I'm not. I'm down here, shifting that, that triangle, and I'm here to serve. And that is truly how I feel. And I'm blessed that I can do that in this lifetime, because there's so much to do. And so, Dr. Hodge said, twist it to the left, Dr. Krebsy, to the left, the button, and then press the button down. So there, so you <laughs> And I, you know, ethics and immigration. We've talked the past few days on ethics, what that is. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But immigration, and I said I'm going to focus on the Latino population. Although I do serve many populations in, in our programs, refugees, immigrants, asylees, African Americans, Filipinos. We have 30 different ethnic groups in, this, in the community that I serve in San Diego, in the City Heights community very diverse. We've seen this slide, yeah? Mm -hmm. And equity, equality, we treat people all the same. So you see the same boxes. But equity, giving one what is needed to succeed. But the reality is, it doesn't always happen that way. Mm -hmm. You know, we're given, we're not given, we stand, whatever it is. It's not always equal. It's not always provided in equity. And so we hold these truths to be self-evident, and it's been that way, that we are men and women <laughs> created equal. But the topic of immigration. So those of you who have seen a word cloud, yeah, hey, I'm a, not a techie, but I did a word cloud. <laughs> so you type your words that you want to show up on this big cloud, and it's a nice application on Google. So, you can actually type your words and then it all comes up in this cloud. And the words that I typed were, how medicine may save the life of U.S. immigration policy. What is that about clinical and educational encounters to the ethics of public policy? 
And what are our rights to enforcement in the healthcare system, to the criminal justice, to the elderly, to the religion or the reproductive justice that we heard? And then the access to healthcare, food, um, other public programs for immigrant families or for any of us that need it. What is that about? And then writing a prescription, I shared that yesterday, that the next prescription will be housing for a better health because that's a social determinant of health. So when we look at this, and we look at the immigration, it's been over 100 years that we've had the public charge of immigrants coming to this country. What does that public charge mean? And the lawyers are in the room, so I'm like, you better watch it. They don't like the doctors, but I love lawyers. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, but the public charge is that Someone who comes to this country should not truly be uh, relying on the government for s sustenance. So they must be able to be able to live on their own or the petitioner needs to be able to support them. So they're not um, taxing our systems on, on the government side. With the exception of refugees and asylees, they do not belong in the public charge. So they can access the services, but it's very limited within a certain amount of time that they come to this country and then they're on their own. So I work with many refugee doctors and many refugee engineers and they come to this country and clean hotel rooms. And I say, I pull them out and I say, what do you want to do? And let's see where we can help you to, to move beyond. But when we look at all of this immigration and I want to tie it into the ethics of health, we look at and I have many programs on pregnant women. We talked about the justice, the pregnancy, the, the all of the above that encompass the woman and the man, except the pregnancy. But how how do we really look at this and say we're being impacted? Because immigration, the challenges of immigration or uh, racial uh, injustice really affects our, our entire being. I'm a cytopathologist. So I look at the cells. For many, many years, I looked at those cells and how I diagnose the tissue diagnosis and how our cells change to become cancer, how can I the in-between change. And when we look at our lives, how do we really, what really impacts us? The immigration, people are afraid to ask for services. They, they disengage from critically important services. They don't want to get their prescription for serious illnesses. And so what happens is that there's now, and we've heard this many times, the impact of the stress from our former generations, our mothers, our grandmothers, our, our grandmothers, on our current lives. African American infant mortality is one of the highest, in the, is the highest in the country. Not only because of the current way that the healthcare system is, but the impact of the stress from generations before has truly changed that epigenetics. Not the gene itself, but what is surrounding that gene so that it changes your life. And so we have an attorney, African-American, who has, at, who is at risk for a high infant mortality <coughs> in spite of the education level and income levels. And so we see the disparities. But what does that really mean? We also now see Barker's hypothesis that says the babies inside of us, the, the growth, the low birth weight, the premature birth, whatever happens to that baby then, uh, the origins of the future starts then. So hypertension, diabetes, they're not correlating all of the chronic diseases on prematurity, low birth weight, and all of the above that happens when, when a child is born. And so that's what that slide is about. And what I wanted to say to you is, and it's a very important uh, aspect or perspective in any of the programs that I work on and work for, is the life course perspective. And what does that really mean? It means to me that at any moment in a person's life that I can impact, it'll affect generations to come. So if there's nothing else that you can remember, please look up life course perspective. There's many things that's going on nowadays that really looks at the life course perspective. And we're very blessed in, in the United States programming for PCI that we're now looking at the, the multitude of programs from the beginning of life and even before preconception. 
you are looking at preconception and how that impacts the births, the lives, and then conception, interconception, that in-between phase of all men and women, children, adolescent girls and boys, and we're, look, we're doing curriculums for mental wellness to prevent anti-human trafficking for girls and boys in school districts. We have programs for that. But also then chronic disease. I now have a program for Alzheimer's. Getting the message out to the community. What is that about? Because yeah, if you can see symptoms that you do not deny, because there's all that denial, then you can get some preventive things. You can do a lot of things that can help you improve the quality of your life. So the life course perspective is truly what we embrace. And when we look at this, it's not equal. It truly is not equal in the health field. And we know that the white community, and um, yes, I belong, I'm a woman of color. So, but you have, they have a, a very, uh, they have less risk factors. I'm pointing to the screen and it's up there. The risk factors are the ones that affect you in your life. So you can see that it's disparity. Very few risk factors, a lot of protective factors for the white community. And so you see all the statistics, the data that show health changes in people of color are worse than those of white. Uh, because we have many risk factors and very few protective factors. And that's the very core of the life course perspective when we think about health and ethics and, and, and everything that happens to us, right? The afraidness of going to the doctor about what they're going to say, or me sitting on the other side and saying, hey, don't do that to that patient. You ask if the patient had breakfast, and she said, yes, she had breakfast, and you're going to put her to anesthesia. I'm like, I was going to surgery, and this woman was across the room, and I'm like, hey, wait, and then I'm like, <laughs> they put me to sleep, and I couldn't speak anymore for that other woman. It's like, okay. But in the past couple of days, you've heard me passionately speak about social determinants of health. Because again, it's an evil, right? But we have many interrelated factors that affect our lives. So when we say critical thinking, we, try, we should try really, and that word should is in there, but we really need to, same thing, need to, uh, focus on, not only focus on one thing, racism or immigration, but really look at what else in my environment is affecting me. Is it my church? Do I have the support? Do I have the meditation? Do I have that inner peace? Do I have access to care, which is critical, right? Of all these changes in the Affordable Care Act. Am I poor? I shared with you the two social determinants of health, health that impact health is lack of education and poverty. Top two. So if we try to address those, then we can we would have made a stride to helping improve health care. Migration, the immigration topic that really scared me when I was given this topic was it's coming to another country. How many of you came from another country? Yourself. 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 So a few, right? Four. Five. I see five that came from another country. What? The country of Alabama. <laughs> Give me our I beg your pardon. I stand corrected. There are those other countries. I heard it. My, my daughter is a professor at the University of Tennessee, and I'm trying to get the accent. Did I do a good job with the accent yet? I, I did this to Dr. Kirksey, and I said, I'm going to visit my daughter in a couple weeks because it's her birthday and my granddaughter's birthday, born on the same day as my daughter. And you can see how my daughter says, really? You come out on my birthday? <laughs> Job of the accent. <laughs> I swear, my granddaughter is one of these days going to say, Abuelita, and I'm going to say, What did you say? I can't understand you. No. So, migration. I digress yet yeah, again. Yeah. So, it's a high level of stress to come to, to go to a different place, even to a different country in the city, in the wherever we are, the urban versus rural. Dr. Kirksey's work in, in policy and looking at all of the things where we live, 
right? The zip code, wherever we are, the communities that we're in, it, is, it impacts us for a long, long time. Our veterans, all of that. It's called Ulysses Syndrome. Oh, don't get me to historic uh, Latin and Greek and, you know, coming back from war and, 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 and really getting the fatigue. But we have all of these things. When the bow breaks, all of those snippets of movies that, that and of course there's the yes and no to some of these things, right? But we know that it impacts. So I want to share with you a, just a, a, a small view of some of the programs that we do to share with you that Alabama has one of the fastest growing Hispanic populations in the country. And so I was told. Uh, by from the, by Dr. Warren and and it really is Hispanic Latino community is one of the fastest growing communities in the country. Period. So we 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 need to understand what our brothers and sisters are also going through, and as much as they need to understand what we're going through on an everyday basis, as the good um, uh, Dr. Hufford uh, has, has said, um, and so border border programs. This is these are pictures I took when I visited the colonias, what we call colonias, the mothers, pregnant women, living in the stable with the horse. They have to drive their pickup truck to get water. It's not just in Africa. My daughter went to Guinea in the Peace Corps, and I did see her carry that water from getting a mile away back to her little house. I did not carry it for her, but she carried it. But, but, but we know that there are issues along the border. And this is what we serve. This is San Diego, the nice water. But, but you can see the wall, the so-called wall, whether it's visible or invisible, there are walls. But we know that along the border, if you look at the data, and I'm not going to bore you with the data. My slides are free to anyone who wants to get them. Just ask Dr. Hodge. Thank you, Dr. Hodge. Uh, and so the data is there. But the poverty is, look at that, you know, more than two times. And along the border. And I must share with you that this, this same issues are among the Latino community throughout the US, but it's it's worse along the border. But there are also white communities. My daughter's in Tennessee, and I said, What are you doing in Tennessee? You're an activist <laughs> for social justice. And she's like, Mom, there are many poor people in, in, you know, in the mountains. And, 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 and she still does a lot of social justice in many parts of the country. And, and the education again, lack of attainment, depression, one in seven, uh, domestic violence, it's a, it's a high incidence in many of our program participants. And then the lack of health professionals in the underserved areas. And, uh, and uh, one of the questions we have for you would be, what about the DACA uh, kids who want to go to medical school to serve the, the underserved areas, right? And so give them a chance. or. I'm not going to go there. So, but then the social determinants of health, the environment, the poverty, what is your support? Look at the data. Uh, higher rates of health, uh, lack of insurance, 17% foreign born, non-English speaker. And I tell you that we have many programs. And one of the things I insist when I, and I, I'm with them, I go to the home visit, and, and I also teach the courses, and I said, you must speak English. You are in the country that speaks English. You must speak English. So we provide ESL with daycare because that's a barrier. So if we're not going to address the barrier, they're not going to come. And they're not going to learn their English language. And so we need to say, speak English. You are in this country now. You belong. You belong. Although I speak Tagalog and Spanish. And I'm from the Philippines. So. And you didn't know that, some of you. I tricked you. Because you greeted me in Spanish, and I said, what? No. <laughs> and I wanted to say to you, I don't see which is my Tagalog. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we also have, I, I'm the principal investigator of one of four in the country organizations that really look at decreasing infant mortality. And we're working with the state title fives, with the home visiting programs. And this is just a snippet of what we're now doing to make the change in infant mortality. Because I tell you, we are the highest 
you know, income oh, country in the world, one of the highest. We are at number 33, lowest uh, in that spectrum, which means we have the, one of the highest infant mortalities in the world. It is so disturbing. And then this Healthy Start program, where one of 100 grantees I shared with you the other day, that really do home visiting using community health workers to be the core, the trusted person in that community that will help access the community. And we also work with the African American communities. We have joint baby showers. And African American communities like the model that's called Centering Pregnancy. And, and they're coming together as a group to really share their experiences. But I'm on, where our organization is on that highest level funding where we mentor the border groups to improve women's health, promote quality services, strengthen family resilience. And I tell you the two benchmarks, I shared with you the benchmark that HRSA is asking us to do on the resiliency piece. How do we bounce back from where we are to really be out there and grasp, take a hold of what we can do is fatherhood or partnerhood. Whoever is there, leading to the children, to the infants and children, and then what are we doing for mental health? That's the resiliency piece that we're addressing throughout the country. And then again, the data, Hispanic, Black, Native American, associated with late entry into prenatal care. So if you know a woman out there who's thinking about getting pregnant, or who is pregnant, say, go to the doctor. And it's not just getting the pregnancy test. That doesn't count as going to the doctor. <laughs> so, and, and that's a challenge along the border. We don't count the medical visit that the Latina women have across the border as having gone to a doctor. So we still call them late pregnancy entry into prenatal care. And we know that the, you, if you go into care in the first trimester, your babies are going to be better. They will have better lives, and the moms will have better lives. So we learned that language is a barrier. That reproductive life plan I shared with you yesterday, that's trying to become a movement in the country to ask that one key question, Are you going, do you plan to get pregnant in the next year? And not only to the women, but to the men. And we need to talk the talk and really see how can we improve these, I will quote it because the good uh, speaker is here, unintended pregnancies. Uh, but we need to really look at what our teenage pregnancies are certain some areas in some country areas are 25 percent teenage pregnancy among all of their teenagers so it's high and then it's i didn't know i was pregnant i was just late so people, women don't know what are what is that about them men don't know uh, what it takes what it takes they know what it takes but, but, but yeah, and they, there are these breath control pills now for men. And they pulled the studies because they said, well, we're having all these symptoms, so we pulled the study. But what about the women, and we had the discussion the other day, what about the women who had many symptoms on breath control pills to the point of stroke, endometrial stuff? They, have, they, have, they take the pill. But what about the men? They say, I have many symptoms, and so we pull the study out. And that's okay because uh, we stand on the backs of those who've come before us, right? And the community health worker program. So there's lessons, and I've talked about the lessons of engagement, that we tell the story, our grandmas tell the story, our moms need to tell the story, but we need to tell the communities the story. And so with regards, I haven't seen the, the flag of how many minutes I have left, five, but the ethics of immigration, she says, six. Thank you, Daniel. So, the ethics of immigration. What are the questions that we need to critically think about when we are faced with our own health issues, with our family's health issues, and for those, our, our elders who, who can't really say, who, oh, do I know you? And, and there's that moment of lapse, you know? And you say, okay, how can I help my elder, my, you know, my grandma or my grandfather? To, to really access care. But it's, it's in, you, we don't want to be in that tunnel focus when we look at all the issues of immigration 
because it's going to affect what? Not just those people that are being affected, but also ourselves because they belong to our community. They belong. And so, some of the questions that I pulled that the good Dr. Kirksey, you know, yeah. uh, no, we're, we're together here. So, we're sharing with you some of the data. I do have selected readings separately about this that I sent to Dr. Hodge and Dr. Warren. And so, how, how can medicine save the life? So we need to look at issues of forced medical repatriation, which is sending them back to their country. We're forcing them to go back to their country. They're already here. Access to health insurance, where else do they go? It's going to tax our system all the more if they go to the emergency room rather than go to the preventive health. So let's think about those issues when we try to help our neighbors or we think about ourselves. Am I going to go to the ER or can I go to my doctor? Because that helps the system. Are we thinking that way? But don't delay. Always. Always think, okay, I have the symptom, I'm going to go. But try to go to the doctor first before the ER, because the ER is expensive. And truly, I have my own activism about the ER rules, but I won't go there. The access of undocumented students to medical education. Um, one of the schools finally accepted uh, DACA students to go to medical school to help with the underserved, right? And then, how should clinicians treat patients who might be undocumented? Well, I am faced with that right now. We just signed, I just signed before I left, what we called consent form for the state of California to be able to send our vital records data to HRSA. And what is one of the questions I asked? I had to demand. I said, uh, are they de-identified? Are you going to be able to identify my participant? in that data. And they promised like crazy, they won't. And I'm saying, really? <laughs> how? So what data are you sending? How, how de-identified is it? So I did not sign that consent form. I finally did when we made changes. Went through headquarters, went through the county, went through other things. And then I'm here and they said, oh, the county had one more revision. And I'm like, hold it. Don't send my piece of paper with my signature on it. But it was fine. But we have to protect the patients. And we need to ask, so is there a pre-existing relationship? You've heard of the nightmares where somebody comes in and then they, people call the, the ICE and then they, they get taken away. They have an illness. But is there a pre-existing relationship? Is it the, it, it is not the duty of the doctor to, um, to share the information if there is that relationship. It's almost like your attorney-client privilege. And, and, you know, state laws are legally protected categories. There are those legally protected categories by state laws. So the bottom line is we need to know our rights. And we need to know that if a situation happens, the hospital or the clinic is also thinking about their own rights. Right? My staff says, can I sell tacos to the rest of the building? Because we're doing a fundraising for what for water. I said, heck no, no. I said, what do you think? Because I do critical thinking. And they're like, well, it's just tacos. I said, well, do we have a license to prepare this food? Do, it's increased liability, so just sell them on staff, and I'll buy three dishes from them. No, but which means I gain another 10 pounds. <laughs> but again, know your rights, know your patient's rights, know your family rights, and that disclosure the right to remain silent in sensitive locations. And sensitive locations are, and that's a, that's a taken legally, that you can remain silent if you are in that sensitive location, hospitals, health healthcare facilities, and that disclosure information. They ask you to sign, right? And, and, and they now have all these tablets when you go into your doctor. Your consent form, how many of you read that consent form? Not, not many. But you just sign, yeah? You just sign and you fancy tablet, I sign, and they even have you now putting your fingers up there. And I'm like, oh, you're taking my fingerprint? Uh, but but we, we need to read, we need to read what it's about, because then we can't complain if we didn't read. So, right versus right is at the heart of our toughest choices, and we've heard that the past few days. We know that. The ethical dilemmas, what does that mean? There's four core dilemmas, right? Truth versus your loyalty, individual versus the community. Is it for the good of that individual, as physicians look at, or is it the public health side? 
Is it for the community? Or is it short term versus long term? Or justice versus mercy? I'm getting the cut off and my Danielle is still not told me. And my Crystal student over there, oh, she said, yes, she told me, but I didn't see. <laughs> and based thinking, nonetheless, it's on my slides. that we need to think about what is the greatest good for the greatest number, what university should have done, what is the golden rule, etc. And remember, and this is one of the, my first slides when I teach, is the social ecological model for the students out there. Aha, uh -huh, I see the nods. It's that individual, but what affects that individual around the organization? And which one, I'm going to do what my previous predecessor did, and which one is the one that's going to impact the most numbers? Tell me, students, anyway. Which layer is going to help impact the most numbers of people? Policy, policy, policy. Because when the government says you must do this, we do it. Seatbelts, etc., etc. So it impacts the greatest numbers of people. Our programs impact small numbers of people. So we apply these rules. Am I going the wrong way? Yes. So just two minutes. Please, thank you. And he said, thank you. I came to this country, oh, so long ago. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. I told someone of my age, she says, oh, okay. <laughs> but when I was 18, from the Philippines, I carried a little card, postcard, that says a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Carried that card with my x-ray. I was 18, I was a college graduate, and I came to this country alone. And then I went to San Jose, where my grandma and my aunt were living. But then I was a, I was a medical technologist. I'd already had my degree. And so I passed the boards for the state of California. And so I went to work at a hospital. But then here comes the legal people and said, oh, excuse me, there are many Americans, um, mostly white Americans, who do not have jobs in your field. You're taking their job away. So here's a list of cities where you can move to. Wow. That need your profession. So I said, what? <laughs> I am, by that time I was 19. And I'm like, okay, so where do I go? So I went to Fresno, Fresno Community Hospital. I lived right across the street in the studio. I didn't know how to drive. I didn't know how to wash clothes. I didn't know how to run the darn uh, washing machine. And I was like, no, I'm going to do this. So, I mean, we each have a story. And from that time on, guess what? My mantra has been, ask. Because if you don't ask, you're not going to receive. You know, I do receive, even when I'm not asking, because, you know. But, but we need to ask, why not, right? During my residency, I would go to Harvard, and I was told no. I said, why not? So the faculty voted. The one person who didn't vote for me was the resident. I went anyway, paid, right. at the Massachusetts right. General Hospital, right. right? So I know you're going to sp spend the reflection, but reflect this time to really think about your own life path and think about what is that? What is that? What is the what is that triggering moment in your life? Write it down and write a book about it. I'll be the first to buy. And then hold that thought because we know we have Dr. Kersey coming in and then we know we're gonna have a QA. And we're gonna share that story. And in holding that thought, the good Dr. Alford, she read poetry. I write poetry, but I wasn't gonna follow that one. Because that's so good. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then, but then I said, okay, what can I do? So while you're holding your thought, I'm going to say to you, she started to do this, and I said in the back, oh, don't do that, because that was going to be what I was going to do. Think about that moment. And I want to share with you that this is our moment. Here at the crossroads of time, we hope our children carry our dreams down the line. They are the vintage. What kind of life will they live? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Alright, our second presenter of the morning will be Dr. Victor Kirksey.
He is a, currently a PhD candidate at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina, studying health services policy and management. Prior to attending University of South Carolina, Mr. Kersey attended Oakwood, Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama, and Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, where he earned his degree, bachelor's degree in health administration and master of public health degree. Mr. Kersey's interest is interest is in improving the access to utilization and the quality health care services for socially disadvantaged populations in urban and rural environments. Mr. Kersey's professional and research goals to synthesize and discern the evidence that will support local, state, and national health policies to improve health and health services for, regardless, for all, regardless of social distinction. Let us um, welcome Dr. Kersey. That sounded so good. South Carolina and a former public health ethics fellow here at the National Center of Bioethics. First, I would like to thank the center for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you all today. And second, I would like to thank Dr. Reyes for an excellent presentation on ethics and, and immigration. Thank you. <laughs> In responding to Dr. Reyes, I would like to speak on the magnitude of immigration in the U.S., the socio-demographics of the foreign-born population, political issues surrounding immigration, and ethical questions that must be asked if our aim is to equitably improve society. So what is immigration? Immigration can be defined as the movements of people from, from one country into another for residential rather than, rather than visiting purposes, which may be for a number of reasons, including economic, social, or personal. What we should know is that whether coming to or coming from Immigrants are striving to improve their lived experiences. So since and before its inception, the U.S. has been a land of immigration, whether it has been for economic opportunity or, or give me one second. Every time I publicly speak, I get this immense anxiety. <laughs> and I never thought that I could be in front of everybody today speaking. Okay. That was never a possibility un until I met Dr. Warren. So okay. this is an extreme tense environment. <laughs> Immigration Act of 1965, which focused on attracting skilled labor and reuniting immigrant families, the number of immigrants has quadrupled. And as of 2016, it's supposed to say 16 there, immigrants represent 13.5% of the U.S. population. Here is a graph that shows us Immigration trends by the decade, so we can see that in 1970, uh, the 
immigrant share of the total U.S. population was about 4.7 percent, and now in 2016, it's about 13.5 percent. So we've been seeing some immense growth. Now. Rhetoric in our national media and within our current White House administration speak as if a considerable number of immigrants are undocumented or here illegally. However, less than a quarter of immigrants um, are actually undocumented. And as you can see, the number of undocumented immigrants has decreased since 2008 when our country endured the Great Recession. Which brings the question, why is, why is immigration currently a point of focus in our political environment? It is not easy to enter the U.S. It is not easy to enter the U.S. There is a rigorous process for obtaining documentation and they are many barriers associated with that, such as financial circumstance and language. And it is important to know that there are many immigrant groups in the U.S. Since 2010, Asians, Hispanics, and, and Latino represent the largest immigrant groups in the U.S. The terms Hispanic and, 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 and Latino represent the largest immigrant groups in the U.S. Of Asian immigrants, top countries of origin are India and China. Two countries that are top ten in world economies as immigration is <laughs> integral to this. <sighs> integral to this nation growth. <laughs> Research shows that Mexico, China, and India are top birthplaces for immigrants in the U.S. <clears throat> According to the U.S. Census, women make up more than half of the immigrants in the U.S. They often rely on family immigration to enter the U.S. because of the social constraints and their lack of access to capital and resources in their country of in their country of origin. As it concerns age, as it concerns age, the foreign-born population median age is 44 years. As compared, to, as compared to roughly 36 years for the U.S. born. It is clear that the foreign born population is aging, but this number does not include children born to the immigrant population. As approximately 5.1 million children resided with an undocumented parent from 2009 to 2013. When we speak of Speaking of immigration, it is important to recognize that we are speaking of families. Well, race continues to confuse and distort cultures as 46% of immigrants, mostly Hispanic, classify themselves as white. Mm -hmm. Research shows that, that 
that the longer families were in America, the more likely they were to classify themselves as white. As whiteness continues to, as whiteness continues to represent over mobility in the U.S. If it's not white, it's not right. <laughs> this happening should not be as the diversity of America should be embraced for what it truly is. As it concerns education, <laughs> immigrants have contributed greatly to this society. Although immigrants as a whole have lower levels of education than the U.S. born, some immigrant groups display higher educational achievement than the U.S. born. We depend on their expertise in our everyday lives and jobs. These groups include the Middle Eastern and the Sub-Saharan African. Another myth often, often communicated within our society is the notion that they take good jobs from U.S. citizens. They do not represent the majority in any U.S. industry and represent just 17% of the total civilian workforce. The majority of immigrants in the workforce are lawful residents and the occupations of undocumented immigrants may differ greatly from the mainstream from mainstream jobs. These jobs typically include service jobs such as housekeeping, construction, and farming. This graph here depicts U.S. jobs that have high shares of unauthorized Im immigrant <coughs> immigrant workers. As farming and as farming and construction are two of the main occupations. As the main occupations for immigrant workers reflect, most immigrants reside in the western and, and southern regions of the U.S. where farming is an integral, where farming is an integral function of the economy as approximately 46% of immigrants reside in California, Texas, and New York. Our next myth buster is that undocumented immigrants do not contribute financially to society, as it is estimated that undocumented immigrants contribute $11.74 billion to the U.S. economy annually and pay 8% of income in state and in the local and and in the local taxes each year. Okay. Their financial contribution to society is clear. Given given their financial contributions to society, undocumented Undocumented immigrants are excluded from public benefits that include Medicaid 
and also Medicare, as 39% of the non-elderly are uninsured. They must rely on a limited amount of safety net, safety net, safety net, safety net clinics such as community health centers or ER rooms for preventable health care conditions. And many delay their care for fear of deportation leading to their conditions being 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 treated in the ER rather than a physician's office. <clears throat> Another note is that the undocumented undocumented population is growing older as more chronic conditions have accompanied this with a with a lack of usable social care. Current current political issues surrounding 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 immigration include DACA, which is a program that protects immigrants under the age of 16 from deportation. Since 2012, 800,000 immigrants have been protected through DACA, but the current White House, but the current White House administration has ended DACA on the basis that it rewards them. Also, the building of a U.S. Also, the building of a U.S. wall has been proposed as a means of border control. And in fact, recently we've had the military deploy to border security missions. As I end this, this brings us to our ethical questions. As, as, you see on the, as you see on the screen here. Is it ethical to deny individuals Is it ethical to deny individuals the right to a more prosperous life should children and adults that have developed in the U.S. be deported back to their country and given their financial contributions to society, should undocumented immigrants be denied government subsidized health care? These are questions, these are questions we must ask ourselves if we are committed to ethics, justice, and the betterment of society.
And so I won gold medal first place. I was crying every day. But then I went to her house and said, why did you leave? And she said, because I knew you got the gold. And I just remember that because to this day, I, I, I read at my church. I tell you, the one thing she told me, I did this. If you are never scared of speaking, you will not be a good speaker. So to this day, before I even come up, I meditate, but I shake. <laughs> but it, it always will be there. I just hope Victory is going to be a politician someday. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys, we're going to go ahead and start with our first question. But I also want to ask um, you, Dr. Reyes, a question. 
because of the information that he brought to you, mm -hmm. how now do you apply that from a programmatic sense as it relates to the health of people? Because if they're trying to be something that they are not in a society, mm -hmm. that imposes even more stress on them, causing them to even be more ill. So how now when you apply this data that this young man has brought and really to your programmatic I told you, your work is so critical. Um, we don't ask. There are many times we don't ask. On the documented versus undocumented question, we don't ask. We just serve. Now, times are changing, and it's very distressing to me. I share with you the consent form. And we now have to have the consent form. Are they wanting to share their data? And it's tied into vital, vital records, which means the birth certificate, or your vital records, or did you go into the hospital? So everything, how many of you think you're not being watched? You are being watched. I mean, you go to Google, and pretty soon you click on something that's coming in as, oh, this or that, and we're being watched. But the point is that we need to protect, right? We don't ask, and we're facing challenge this coming year on needing to ask. And so the women are not coming in, the men are not coming in, the women, the immigration status, even if they are legal, they don't come in because their family, their families are not legal. We, we even go to their communities now to teach the key messaging. That's why we are funded by CDC, but from a total model, the community health worker model, that go to the communities because they don't want to come to us now. But if they don't want to come to us, it is an ethical responsibility to go to them in order for us to give them the service. It's going to be tough in implementing the programs. I try my very best to not ask and to serve equally uh, with equity right? and equality. Um, equity, mostly, because equality treats, yes, so equity. <coughs> Providing them what they actually need. Uh, it's, it's tough. I hope that helps. It's, it's a limbo question. Dr. Reyes, this is about the consent form. You have to have an operation. You read it, and certain things you do not agree with. But if you do not sign it, you do not get operated on. Yeah. Now, if you do not sign it, how do you get around the fact that uh, you don't agree with certain things about it, but you know if you don't sign it, you're going out of pre-operable. How do you deal with that? Right. So number one, they have to have a witness of your signature, right? So it's a designated witness. But what you do is, if you don't agree with certain items, you write it out. I'm signing this, but I don't agree with A, B, and C. And, and that way it's documented. So even in anything that we do, we need to document. My staff, okay, your supervisor talked to you. That's verbal. Write it out. Hey, as far as our discussion, this is what happened. Write it out. Because unless you, you do that, you're signing. Because you need the surgery. And I must tell you, it's that um, liability issue, right? The hospitals have to protect themselves. The doctor has to protect themselves. I mean, we are a litigious society. We, we can't blame that. We are really protect, trying to protect ourselves. But then there's the other spectrum of the doctors, the nurses, the hospitals also trying to protect the liability of, the, of their work. And, uh, and, and so that's important to do. You, you must sign because then you don't get the surgery, the surgery especially, especially if, it, if it's elective, then you can choose someone else who will, who will do it for you based on what your rights are. But when you don't, when it's an emergency, Technically, you must be served, so you sign, but you try to put your um, documentation of what you don't like about the document. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly Carr. I am a third generation descendant of the USDA Chef Sister Study um, at Tuskegee. I am also a fourth year integrated biosciences PhD student here at Tuskegee University. I'm also the Vice President of the Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation, where I'm working with the foundation to move uh, the next five years for a younger generation to come in. I'm also one of Dr. Warren's students, and I'm also a, a, a attended 
Morehouse School of Medicine MPH program I have my degree. So I understand anxiety very well. Matter of fact, yesterday Dr. Warren had to say, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. He stopped me. I had my stroller with the infant I just pushed out a month ago. You know, he's telling me to slow down. I had to submit. So I understand 100% of what you're going through, knowing that I have to defend in a few months and I'm applying for a candidacy. So we're, we're on the same spectrum. <laughs> so I understand the immense um, anxiety, but it's also, it shows passion for what you have. So I understand that 100%. So my research is in environmental justice, um, health disparities, and food insecurity. And when I looked at the data, right after African Americans, it's Latino population. Right after food insecurity, it's 19.2%, you know, for um, a Latino um, Americans, undocumented and documented. So my question is, how do we, or how do doctoral students in public health, especially health disparity research, um, um, bring in the forefront of immigration into our work as an implication of the work that we're doing, this health disparities or this policy. Because again, if we're the change agents for um, for the field, how can we bring that into focus as well? And I'm familiar with the social ecological model. And yes, it does start with public policy, but as you know, students on that level, we have to go towards the upper mobility. So how can we incorporate that into our work, especially in the STEM fields as well? Because at the same time, I, I, I digress, but with uh, cancer lines and stem cell lines and everything else, we have to uh, be aware of who we get our data from. So uh, again, to bring it back home, how do we bring the, the topic of immigration into our work? I, I was going to do this to him, right? I, I, I am going to say, Dr. Percy, because the other speakers always, when they didn't want to answer the question, went to the other speaker and said, Dr. Percy, will you take this? Well, for me, this is my first time with this topic. So while I was doing my research, I struggled. Um, I called Dr. Warren probably daily. Because <laughs> I really wasn't comfortable with it. I didn't really understand it. Um, all I had known was what I had seen on the news because I watched CNN daily. Uh, articles that I've read because I also read those daily as well. Um, so I guess what made it easier, easier, although it didn't come out as what I, you know, <laughs> it didn't come out how I intended it to. But for me, I've been working from the same framework for a very long time. And whatever struggles we go through, they go through as well. Maybe not the same exact struggle, but everything that's bad is always is 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 always attached to all those groups. Everything is bad. Nothing good really comes from it except from what comes uh, except from what comes within, from our own family and like things of that sort. But outside of this environment, everything is bad. And a lot of people make a lot of money off of it too. And all their research and things of that sort, they don't really care about what we go through, but it's a topic that they cover. Uh, and because it's very lucrative. So take for instance, I'm a doctoral student at USC. Now South Carolina is a very, um, it's a racist state. Like it is. on the highway. I mean, the road rage is crazy. Um, so I think if we just kind of know that we all are going through the same struggles, um, you know that it'll make the job a little bit easier whenever you try to integrate those populations. I want to share for the students, and you asked about your thinking. Um, one of the things that we need to emphasize when you're doing your work is actually field participation of community members and program participants. Uh, 
uh, in one of my programs, thankfully, we are being tasked to have in our community action network, that's a must, one, have a community action network, and two, 25% of your membership need to come from the community. And they're not academic, they're not nonprofits, they're community members. So if we go on that premise of involving the community and making sure it's true community-based participatory research that we've made strides. We, we, we can name it community-based participatory research, but you're still going top down. Doesn't work. We're never going to get ahead unless you truly involve the community bottoms up. So before I transition to my, to my clinical practice, to public health, I actually went through three monasteries and said, what do I want to do? And then it says, okay, go to your master's in public health. So I went back to school at age 50. I'm giving you my age. That was a long time ago, too. But, <laughs> but, so then I went back to school and went to master's of public health. But I said, wait a minute. I want to learn about community economic development first because I come to serve, and I was president for the American Cancer Society for the state of California already, but we had programs. I was one of the pioneers for breast and cervical cancer treatment programs in, in California, but they don't come. We have free programs, they don't come. What is that? So I needed to understand community economic development. So I went to the business school to learn that, and then went to the public health to, to get my master's in public health. But understanding that it, it is time to stop the stop down approach. It is time to continue and really, really make sure we're doing it, not just speaking it, that it's from the bottom up in order to make those changes. And we must demand of the researchers and our PhDs, I'm a public servant, so to really bring back your studies to the community, engage them, tell them this is what's happening. And because it's a two-way street, you're going to demand them of your time, their time, but then you're not giving it back to them. So make sure that there's true participation from a diverse group of community members in anything that you do. And that will help you tremendously and move us more forward to, to having better outcomes for our families and children. Okay, my name is Joyce Christian, and um, I just want to clarify something that I think everybody in this room can relate to. <laughs> my name is Joyce Christian, I know I talk a lot, my sister over here says, but I always have a... I, I, I have um, concerns, and I want to express those concerns. And um, we're all now under a different administration, and I was grateful to Dr. Kersey for bringing out that this is the truth. This is not fake news about New York being one of the three <coughs> highest <laughs> immigrant uh, areas, states in the United States. Well, maybe that's why Donald Trump is so opposed to it. DACA, I don't know. But your research has given us information that is truthful about the real story. And of course, we all listen to the news like you were saying. So it's bringing us to a different level. Thank you for that. Now, Dr. Red. Yes, sir. No, wait. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I gotta do it. I, I love it. I write with our own books. Yeah. We, we, we met over a pair break. Yes. Wonderful boys. So anyway, I want to know from you: Have you had any activism against what you're doing in your field, and how you have handled that? 
both ways. I'm an activist, so I've actually picketed. <laughs> but not built in my past life before my organization. In my organization, we're not allowed to pick. We have to do it on our own, but it's protective of the organization. But yes, we have. But it's, it's more the surrounding areas. My own programs have not been picked, have not been. I have not had that rally against my programs. Um, however, there has been in the building where we um, are, are, there are 21 nonprofits in there, and there have been pickets outside of the building. And so we are always prepared because we are right, our, our office is right next to Planned Parenthood. So you can imagine how my, uh, my organization is like, okay, we have to, we have to lock doors, there's people, there's, but we have to be open to our pregnant women, families, whoever needs the services. So we've been cautious about those things, but we've not actually been picketed. But I, on the other hand, have gone out there and picketed <laughs> so, uh, with the Congress people and uh, whoever else as a person. Uh, although, so in answer to that, no, my, my programs have not been picketed, but there are many programs around where I live that have, have had those challenges and being put to task as far as that goes. And we, we've had the walks, we've had the things where there's two sides, and also in San Diego. So that's, that's the reality that happens. But we are prepared. Uh, we hold workshops with the legal departments, in the community to bring awareness. So we do do that. And we bring that awareness to the community. And we know that some of the participants won't come because they fear that when you advertise certain programming, ICE will be there. And so it's, it's very difficult, very difficult times, very scary times. But, yes. This will be our last question for this session. I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm Dr. Kevin Williams, uh, assistant professor of healthcare leadership at Mercer University, and also uh, original class member of the Master of Public Health Program at Moore High School of Medicine back in 1995. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to thank you, uh, future Dr. Kirsten, for your presentation. I'm extremely proud of you. Uh, teaching leadership studies, and leadership starts with self, and uh, I work with corporations and do some executive coaching and um, part of the battle is people don't know what they need to work on. And the fact that you know what you need to work on is a huge step. Um, I also have been a mentee of Dr. Warren over 20 some years and um, I'm sure he shared this story with you before but I, it always stuck in my mind. Um, I was struggling with some writing early in my career and he said, um, you know, when I went to Harvard, I didn't know how to write. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I went to Harvard in my MPH program and I did not know how to write. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, how did you learn how to write? He said, by writing. <laughs> and so I would just say that you'll get more comfortable um, speaking by speaking. And so I, I challenge you to continue to present. You presented some great information. We all needed it. Um, and so just continue on, my brother. One quick question, or one, I guess a comment for all of us to think about in light of your presentation and the data, and uh, the sister started the, the conversation, how do we win the social marketing, the social marketing argument, uh, this false narrative that immigration or immigrants are taking all of everybody's jobs, um, your data clearly shows that that's not the case. So we all are challenged with the dissemination of the right information. Um, this anti-fake news is, is what we're all challenged with. How do we market impact? Public health doesn't do this well enough. We don't social market our outcomes the way we need to. And so I challenge all of us in here, how do we change the narrative uh, when it relates to this false narrative about us uh, immigrants taking people's jobs. We've got to work on that. Uh, it's an information war right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be at the forefront because we have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we have to pay if we don't figure out a way to distribute it and, uh, and, and get it out there to the people. That's my last comment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we're going to thank our speakers and our speakers. Thank you.